ain't perfect I got blood on my hands too And maybe we do all the things that we do Because somebody hurt me like somebody hurt you
morning. morning. Turn to somebody and say good morning. morning. How are you guys today? It's an awesome day to be in the house of the Lord. Any day is an awesome day to be in the house of the Lord. But you just so happen to be in the best house. Just saying. Today we are so blessed to have you here joining us, our family. Welcome home. If you're here for the first time, we'd love to get to know you a little bit. So after the service, if you want to in our lobby, we have a um, place where we have you fill out a card and get some of your information so we can get to know you a little better. And also out in the lobby and throughout the um, service here, we have boxes for you to give your tithes and offering. We don't do a formal offering here at Skyline Church. And if you'd like to give, we also have an app um, on our church app, churchonskyline.com. And you just pull down the app and you can give right there. How many of you are just so excited to be here? There is joy in this house. And you see, because there's joy in this house, I was thinking about the scripture verse that says, the joy of our Lord is our strength. Some of you know it. But the question is, we know it, but do we do it? Do we internalize that? You see, because our circumstance sometimes is really bad and (laughs) the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's where your strength comes from. And he inhabits the praises of his people. So let's continue to worship God here in this house. We're so glad you joined us. And let's show some love and some joy right here.
church just here right now in this moment just in the softness and the stillness of this moment right now can we just start to lift up our voice before our heavenly father just that song that's within your heart that song that he's placed within you and in your lungs just begin to lift your voice thank him for who he is to you thank him for being your savior thank you thank him for being your healer thank him for being your provider thank him for bringing you wholeness to a broken life in this broken world lord jesus right here in this moment we lift our voice the lungs that you put breath of life into God we lift and we raise to you today because you are worthy there is none worthy beside you there is no one who stands in comparison to you oh God for you are great you are holy you are worthy you are mighty you are my God you are my king you are my savior you are my healer you are my provider you are the one that leads me through the valley of the shadow of death yet I fear no evil because you are with me Lord God I lift my voice to you I raise my lungs to you today because you are God God Almighty, whom none compares to. You are great. Your name stands alone, and you are worthy, O oh God. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you. We choose to live a life of gratitude before you because of the great price that was paid for us, O oh God. And so we stand here in this moment in your presence with just a sincere thank you sincere gratitude on our mind and on our heart because we could have never accomplished the great feat that you've accomplished for us the gift of life the gift of salvation the eternal life oh god that your work provides for us that your word navigates for us so jesus we thank you and we love you and we so choose to honor you in how we live and how we speak and in our relationships and in our life and in our business dealings. We choose to honor you in all those different avenues and many, many more, Lord Jesus, because of who you are to us and how you allow your work to take place within us. And so God, refine us. If there be any hard edges in us, edges where we're just digging in our heels and we're not giving you the full authority that you have to say so in our lives, Lord Jesus. I pray that we would right now relinquish that to you. That we would allow you the space to work. That we would give you the room to move in our heart, in our life, in our mind, in our homes, in our families, in our relationships, wherever it's needed, oh God. And so we choose to say yes to you. Just a simple word of obedience. Yes, Lord Jesus. So God, this place today, that's what we desire, to say yes to you, to have a heart of gratitude and follow in the ways that you call us into obedience. So Lord, we love you and we honor you and we worship you and we are so grateful for all that you are. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, amen. Real quick, just say welcome home to a person near you as you're seated today. I am so glad you are here with us today, and uh, if you were here last week, you had the benefit, or if you watched online last week, we had a guest missionary that just did a fantastic job of sharing a little bit about what he and his family do overseas, but we were also presented with the opportunity of committing to a faith promise pledge. And so some of you made this commitment, and thank you so much for jumping on board with supporting missionaries literally around the world um, through the, the 
faith promise cards that came in last week. Uh, it indicates about a $5,800 or so commitment for a 12-month period um, that we want to dedicate to missions. And so I want to present that to you. If you did not jump on board or if you're maybe considering it or you went home, you're like, oh, I'll think about it. Then you forgot about it as soon as you got to your car and got to lunch. Well, I'm reminding you, okay, because you can join in on bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ around the world. Maybe you can't physically go there, but you can help the people that God has called to go there. And so we want to pray for them, but we also want to help with their financial commitment as well. So you can do that. These are located on the table right outside the doors as you exit the sanctuary today. We also have the Spanish version. So En Espanol, if that benefits you. Uh, you can help kind of navigate through this. I'm very limited in my Spanish, so that's about the most you'll get out of me today. But uh, go ahead and fill that out. You can just drop off the big portion of the card. It's a perforated deal there. Drop it off in one, one of our offering boxes. And you keep the little card as a reminder uh, for your faith promise over these next 12 months. So that'll help remind you to pray for our missionaries, but also to give either on a weekly or a monthly commitment as you would designate that. We are in week three of our Nehemiah series called The Good Work, and today our message title is Standing Strong in the Face of Opposition. Some of you are like, man, I was really hoping for like one of those like, yeah, go get them kind of <laughs> like wind in the sail kind of messages today, and uh, we're talking about opposition, all right? And I'm, I'm pretty much guaranteeing you that anytime God leads you to do anything good, anything meaningful, anything generous or lasting, you can expect opposition to come your way. You're like, oh man, I don't need this today. I don't want to hear about opposition and pushback. You're like, that's my whole week. All right, some of you parents out there, you're like, just today, it was horrible. All right, trying to get to church. Can't even get shoes on my kid. Can't get them in their car seat. You know, the struggle's real, right? Anyone else on the struggle bus? Oh man, there's like some hands raised. We should just have an altar call right now. <laughs> my wife and I, like there's so many times we look at each other, we're like, how are we supposed to do anything meaningful and important in this life when it feels like we're dragging boat anchors behind us in every opposition or every obstacle we try to run through. Like, that's what life feels like sometimes. There's just so much opposition coming against you. Maybe you experienced some of that. You found that to be true. And so there's that resistance that you face. Adam and Eve, what do they have? They had the serpent, right? Moses had Pharaoh. David had Goliath. Jesus, he had Herod. Jesus had the Pharisees. Jesus had the Jewish leaders. Jesus had Judas. He had the devil. He had demons. Batman has the Joker, right? There's opposition everywhere. And for Nehemiah, Nehemiah had two characters coming against him. He had Sambalat and Tobiah. And these were two individuals that didn't want to see Nehemiah succeed in what the Lord had placed upon his heart. You see, that heavy burden that the Lord put on Nehemiah's heart to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the city of his ancestors, the city of his people, that was considered the holy place, the, the land of the Lord, okay? Jerusalem inhabited the temple. The temple was the Lord's house, the place where people went to make sacrifices and the place to worship the Lord and the place where they came to encounter the Lord. And through a series of disobedience in the Jewish lives, the, the Israel lives, their lives, through their disobedience, the Lord gave them over to the hand of their, uh, their captors. And so through that process, the city of Jerusalem was literally destroyed. And they were taken into captivity for hundreds of years. Nehemiah hears about this, and his heart breaks. And if you remember about Nehemiah, or if you're maybe just picking up with us, Nehemiah is just kind of an ordinary guy. You know, he's not a reverend. He's not like an official of the town or anything like that. There's nothing really special about him. He had a special position that he had. That was probably the greatest thing that he had where he was in good relationship with the king, King Artaxerxes at, at that time. And he was the cup bearer, cup bearer to King Artaxerxes. He was the king of Persia in that season. But he was under bondage of that nation along with all the other Jews from Jerusalem. And so his position gave him the opportunity to, to say yes to the Lord and to start rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. So what did he do? He wanted to go back to his hometown with this burden he had, this burden on his heart that just broke for his people, for his nation. So he travels a thousand miles. He couldn't fly there. They had to walk, okay? It was a long journey. They would take sometimes animals with like carrying supplies and that, but it was a long, grudging journey. Uh, and he inspires these people to come with him. 
You know, they know the decimation, the, the desolation that, that Jerusalem is in. They know the condition of the city and that it's in bad shape and it's in ruins, it's in rubble. In fact, it's been the laughing stock of other nations. Your city doesn't have walls anymore. The temple that you valued so greatly is in ruins, it's in ash, it's crumbled, it's gone. And they're laughing at them. They're making fun of them. And yet he convinces people to go back and says, the Lord is leading us to rebuild our city to reestablish our walls, to put things back in place where they need to be. And so they start this process and they start rebuilding. And it was thought to be impossible to get things back to where they were, but they start rebuilding the gates, these points of entry into their city. And they rebuild the sheep gate and the fish gate and the valley gate and the horse gate and the water gate and even the dung gate. These are literal, real gates that were used for specific purposes in that time. You think real estate costs a lot here? Like if you want waterfront property here right now in Cape Coral, like Southwest Florida, can you imagine what like property prices would have been like the farther away from the Dungate you get, the more like that price tag is? That's probably a real struggle right there. Now the people that came with them to rebuild, that came with Nehemiah to rebuild this city, they weren't the skilled people you would envision. They weren't the masons. They weren't the carpenters. These were goldsmiths. These were perfume makers. These were merchants. They weren't in their element. These weren't the ideal people. These weren't the tradesmen, so to speak, of the day. And so he's trying to muster the strength of these individuals to make progress to rebuild their city. And so he's making progress. He's saying, look, we can do this. We can rally together and we can make a difference. And this thing is happening. It's going down. Work is happening and taking place, right? And so what we see here is that when the work goes down, the opposition shows up, yes. right? You start making progress. You think like spiritually in your life. You're like, all right, so I committed my life to Jesus. I'm making a choice to, to change my life. The old habits I used to live, I'm not doing anymore. But yet what I'm doing and I'm choosing to do is I'm saying yes to Jesus and his ways and the ways that they're mapped out in scripture. And as you start to take those steps and as you start to step out in obedience and in faith and in obedience to the word of the Lord, what do you experience? Some of that old lifestyle starts rearing its head, right? Some of those old habits start popping back into play. Those voices or those relationships that you've said bye to for months ago start popping back up into your world and start trying to pull you and start trying to drag you down and they become an opposition to the growth and the progress that you've made or are committed to making in your life. Nehemiah and his people are experiencing opposition as the work is taking place. Nehemiah chapter four. You can follow along on the Skyline Church app and our sermon notes as well. Um, but Nehemiah four, verse one. When Sambalot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He was enraged. He was just furious. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, Samaria he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? You see, Sambalot was a Samarian, um, Samarian. He was an op opponent to the Jewish people. The Jews and the Samaritans, they did not get along very well at all. They were enemies and they did not like each other. And so he was making it his biggest task and accomplishment to make sure that Jerusalem would not get rebuilt. So what does he do? He begins to push back against them and he talks to all of his associates in the armies to fight against the Jewish people as well. But that term there, when he calls them those feeble Jews, what that term actually means is it's the same word that describes a flower that's been cut off, that's dead, that there's no life left within it. So he's saying they are done. What are they thinking that they can even rebuild this city? There's only a few of them. There's no way they're going to make this happen. Let's continue. Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their walls of stone, their wall of stones. Now that like illustration there, a fox is kind of a light, nimble little animal that kind of hops and skips over different like obstacles and on and off things. He's saying even that light of a pressure on those walls would be toppled over because of their terrible efforts. Talk about opposition, right? When the work goes up, when the work goes down, the opposition shows up. It happens. It's a reality, right? And so anytime God leads you to do anything good, meaningful, generous, or lasting, expect opposition to rear its ugly head in your life. Expect obstacles. Expect resistance. 
You know, in your story, in your life that you're living, you're maybe trying to do something that's, that's different. Like you're trying to apply faith into what you're, you're taking steps forward in. And you just probably experience resistance in that. There's spiritual opposition to the things that we face when we're taking steps forward as we try to follow in obedience to the Lord. Maybe you're trying to go to church for the first time in a long time, right? And you get in the car and you're running late. And it seems like you're hitting every red light. And, you know, it's just such a fight to get out of the door. Or maybe you're trying to get out of debt, right? You're being diligent. You're being obedient in tithing. You're being obedient in budgeting your money in a proper biblical way. And all of a sudden the car breaks down. Like, what do I do now? Come on, that was my money. I was getting back on track. You know, it's, it's invigorating. Uh, maybe you want to start serving in, in ministry, right? You're like, I'm going to serve in a kid's room. And sure enough, you show up on your first day to serve, and you're down there with the little ones, and all of a sudden, little Billy just doesn't feel well. And here comes his Fruit Loops all over your clothes. Opposition takes on many different forms, let me tell you. Sometimes it's Cheerios coming up. Sometimes it's, it's the traffic. It's the red lights. It looks different, but it's all real in our lives. Whenever you're doing something, maybe, that the Lord feels like he's laid on your heart, maybe he's given you a burden, and you're starting to share that with someone that you're close to, a close friend, a, a parent, a loved one, a spouse, and you're like, man, I, I really feel like I need to go in this direction. I need to help this person or do this and to help them out. And the response you get is, are you serious? Why, why would you do that? That's opposition. That's pushback. That can be debilitating at times. And I know in our lives, my wife and I, this past summer, we were supposed to go on a missions trip about halfway around the world for about 10 days or so. And we were making plans and we, we felt like, you know, this was an opportunity that the Lord was leading in our lives. In fact, over the course of the past couple years, the Lord has literally brought missionaries to the nation that the Lord laid on my wife's heart from the age of five into our path. Like we know missionaries that are physically on the ground doing ministry in a country that she has a passion and a desire to go and make a difference in. And through a series of events and timelines and delays, this past summer, we weren't able to make that trip happen. Opposition comes at us from every angle. And when you're trying to follow the Lord, you're going to face it. So don't be surprised when you face opposition. It's there. It's real. And know this, that advancement invites opposition. And as you feel like you're striving forward and you're making progress, don't be surprised when something pops up out of nowhere to try to throw you off your rhythm, to try to derail you from what you're doing, what God has called you to do. And then the devil doesn't bother those who aren't a threat. So if you're like, man, I'm not experiencing this opposition. Things are pretty good. Well, how engaged are you? How much buy-in do you have to what the Lord wants for your life and wants you to be active in in your life? Okay, because listen, if you want an easy life, here's what you do. If you just want to coast along, just do your comfortable thing. Do what you feel is good. Don't stretch the limits. Don't push the boundaries. Don't, don't get overactive. Don't serve. Don't give. Don't care. Don't tithe. Don't make a faith promise. Go to church if you want to. Like as you casually want to, when it's good for you, when it maybe fits your schedule, or if you feel like you're obligated to go, don't engage, don't pray, don't worship, don't lift your hands, don't give. Do something spiritual just to make yourself feel good, to make yourself appease so that you feel like you're in like right standing with God. If you want an easy life, that's the way to do it. Just kind of coast, kind of do the bare minimum. Just kind of just stay right here. That's, that's about it. Don't push forward and, or make any effort. But the moment you, you step out in faith, I want you to understand that as soon as you step out and you start to step up, you're engaging in battle. That there's a target that goes on you because you are now becoming an offense to the enemy of your soul. He knows and he sees that you're going to want to make a difference. That you're taking steps to be better, to grow deeper in your faith, to grow in Christ. And he understands that there's collateral damage that is coming your, your, his way if you keep on the track of growing and being obedient to God. And so he wants to squash that as fast as he can. And so opposition is going to come your way. Real encouraging, right? <laughs> I warned you today. There's always opposition. There's always critics. There's always haters. And a lot of times, the loudest voices come from the cheapest seats. Isn't that true? They're the people in the back. No offense back there. Maybe you're going to want to sit a couple rows forward next week. But it's always those cheap seats that are like, boo, you can't do it. You're never going to make it. 
right? It's that opposition. And some great philosophical, a philosophical quote I want to share with you this morning is, say it in the streets, that's a knockout, but you say it in a tweet, that's a cop-out. That's right, I just quoted Taylor Swift on a Sunday morning. <laughs> There's haters everywhere, people. They might be in your face talking to <laughs> pictures, yes, tweet, post that. <laughs> All of our Swifties out there. There are haters everywhere. There, are, there is opposition everywhere, all right? You're going to experience it. It might be face-to-face. It might be right there coming at you every day. It might be online, socially. There's all different forms it takes. There's opposition, and it's real. And so as you start to step up, and as you start to make a difference, there's going to be that opposition, the naysayers, the critics, the haters, the doubters. And most of the time, what do you do when you face them? What do you do? Like, how do you engage with them? How do you respond to them? Most of the time, the best thing to do is to don't. Don't engage with them. Don't take the bait. My three boys, they love to irritate the snot out of each other. (laughs) Love it. One of them lives for it. Like, it's part of his morning routine. Like, hmm, okay, I got up, I got dressed, I made my bed, I brushed my teeth, I ate breakfast. Oh yeah, I got to irritate someone. What am I going to do today? I'm going to be a naysayer. I'm going to be a hater. I'm going to stir the pot a little bit and start saying like little things to irritate his brother's. Right? They know how to get under each other's skin. Haters are real. Right? (laughs) But here's the difference I've noticed. We tell our kids, look, when someone's bothering you and just trying to get under your skin and ruffle your feathers, what do you do? Ignore it. Okay? Don't take the bait. Don't bite on it because it just gives them the win. They're like, yeah, I got them. You know, check. (laughs) Got my day full. Did my to-do list today. If we don't engage, we don't give them power over our lives. We don't let them affect us. We don't give them a platform to speak into our mind, into our heart. And so we have to ignore it. Look what Nehemiah did. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't respond. He doesn't answer. He doesn't defend all that hateful speech that Sambalat and Tobiah are saying. He doesn't engage with them. He doesn't give them the platform in his life. You know, he he ignores it. And so your response isn't going to convert a critic. It's not going to change their stance. It's not going to change their view on you. Your response isn't going to win someone over in faith. There's times when you see like an evangelism opportunities that people have where uh, you might see like someone out on the street. And I, I've seen this actually in like downtown Fort Myers is there's, there's people out there sometimes with big signs or a little boom box or like a little side like PA system. And they're out there like yelling that you're going to hell, you need Jesus, and blah, 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 you know, and just arguing with people and just really kind of stirring the pot and not really making an eternal difference at all. You know, there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this stuff. And so if we engage and if we, like, push the wrong agenda and if we are saying the wrong things, it doesn't accomplish anything. You're not going to win critics over by arguing someone. I rarely ever have seen anyone argued into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, loving... That's a totally different scenario. If you love someone and have honest, open, real conversations and have a a loving relationship with them, you have all the platform in the world to share your faith and show them who Jesus is in your life. Complete difference there. So you're not going to argue a critic into making a difference and taking a different stand on their life. It's not always easy to deal with the haters. You know, all those people that are out there. But it's even more difficult to deal with those that love you, to deal with the loved ones in your life. These are the people in close proximity to you, your friends, your brother, your sister, your parents, you know, someone that you trust, someone that you care about. And when they say something like, I I don't think you should really do that. I don't think that's a good idea. I I think you're you're way off on that. Why would you do that? That's a bad idea. That's a horrible (laughs) idea. Why would you ever think of doing that? You know, don't be stupid. Why would you do? You can't do that. Don't quit your job. What are, you, what are you thinking? You know, just stuff like that, that when you try to take steps forward in answering the call of God in your life, you're going to hear some of this. And sometimes it's from the people that we care about. In fact, when I was going to Bible college, a comment that my dad made, and I know he made it in the most sincere way. He meant it in the most sincerity with the most authentic heart. Because I was looking to be a youth pastor. And if you know anything about ministry and pay grade, youth pastors are like like down here, (laughs) okay? 
And it's like, hey, you know, I, I don't want you to live in my house the whole rest of your life. Like, I want you to be able to provide an income for yourself to, you know, one day have a wife and a family and support yourself and live out of my roof. And so that's going to take money to do. And so, you know, you might want to think of a backup plan. And that can be debilitating. You know, when you hear like, hey, don't quit your day job or you need a backup plan or what are you going to do if this doesn't work out? Those are some real words. Those, that's some real opposition there if you receive it that way. Now, I know my dad didn't mean that as a critic or as a, a hater. I, I know he meant it as a, a voice of care and concern for me and my future. But if it's taken the wrong way or if it's from someone that you know they maybe have an edge to them, it could have an ill effect on your life. So critics take on many forms and sometimes they're close to us. You know, maybe you're saying like, man, I really feel a burden to, to be a foster parent. There's kids out there in the foster system that need a home of, of, with you know, loving parents and guardians for a while. And I, I think I can do that. And the, the voice that comes against you would be like, well, why are you taking on more kids? You can't even take care of your kids. You know, you might hear that. Or maybe you're thinking of starting a, a small group. You know, and you hear like the voice of who do you think you are? You don't know enough. You're like new to this faith thing. What, how are you going to lead people in Jesus? Or maybe you're too old or you're too young or you're too inexperienced or you're too busy. I would say you're too negative. I would say you don't know the power of God in our lives. When we say yes to God, he's able to make provisions and, and opportunities available for us as we step out in obedience. And so let's follow that voice of God and squash the voice of the critics. We also have to commit to this that I'm not going to be moved by praise or criticism. That's one of those things that we need to have concrete in our lives. And here's what it means. I'm not going to let praise get into my head, and I'm not going to let criticism get into my heart. You see, when praise goes into our head, it can become very toxic, yep. right? Yep. We get this overinflated ego, like, yeah, I'm the guy, I'm the man, look at me, I'm the woman, I did this, I had a killer week, I'm crushing it, right? That praise goes to your head, and then what happens? Chances are when you mess up, there's a lot of other people just pointing at you saying, bigger than you thought you were, right? How's it going now? You're not high on the horse anymore. But when that criticism gets to your heart, it can be crippling. It can stop you dead in your tracks. And so it's important to not let praise go to our head or criticism go to our heart. Now, Nehemiah knows this. And so he doesn't answer the critics. And instead, he answers to God. Look at this. Look what he does. He, he doesn't engage a lower level. Instead, he engages to a higher level, the ultimate level of authority. He prays to God. So verse 4. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Now, this is Nehemiah's prayer. It might not be the best example of prayer. Some of you are like, yeah, he's like praying for like the wrath of God to come down on them. That's how I want to pray. Like, that's not the best approach to prayer. But yet he's expressing his heart fully in his anguish and frustration as he's trying to do a good work. And he's receiving this opposition against him. And so he's praying with just all sincerity. And uh, whenever we're facing opposition, we can go before the Lord. We don't have to engage the critics in the lower levels. We can go right to our Heavenly Father and ask for his help. Verse 5, do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Verse 6, so we rebuild the wall. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. Look at what Nehemiah did. He paused to pray. And then he got back to work. And I love this because it's beautiful. He pauses to pray in a very difficult moment of opposition that could make or break the whole project. And then he gets back to work. So he does something spiritual, but then he does something practical too. And I think we need to apply this to our lives as well. There's a lot of times I've heard people make a comment of like, man, I can't wait to get to this one spiritual convention because I can't wait for God to just wreck my life. I need God to mess me up. You know, if you've ever been like a teenager growing up and go to youth convention or youth camp and you just know those are moments where God's gonna just, just take over your world. Your whole life for those days is just dedicated to God time, God presence, and, and just great environment and, and interaction with God. And so you look forward to those moments. 
But then when you get back home and like, like you have to go back to normal life, you don't know how to like translate that. How does my God experience go into normal life? There's no practical application to that anymore. It was there for the moment, but now it's gone. And so, you know, we can weigh heavy to one side or the other of just spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. Man, I can't wait to get to church and get recharged. And, and you know, I need church to get through the week. You need church to get through today, okay? You need church to be with other believers. You need church to hear the voice of God and to help hear the message of God and where the church is going. But you need God for everyday living in your practical steps and practical routine and your work calendar and your schedule and, and raising your kids and, and running a home substantially uh, according to the ways of God. And so you need both. We need both. We need the spiritual experience where we encounter a living God, but we need the practical application of when we're meeting with God one-on-one, when we're making decisions and choices and we're making the right practical, taking those right practical steps to help guide us through a daily endeavor of, of everyday life activity, okay? So we need the disciplines of the practical life, but we need a spiritual encounter that's going to affect our life and guide us through the practical steps. Is that understood? It's got to be a balance. And so you can't be lopsided one way or another. Now, me personally, I am as practical as it gets, okay? I'll be fully honest with you here. So I need to be diligent in allowing God to really work through the spiritual process in my life, to have those landmark moments, to have those encounters with God on a very regular basis so that it infiltrates my life and creates that balance. Maybe you're one or the other. I want to encourage you, find that balance. Find that place where you're going to experience the spiritual and live it out in the practical, we got to do that. We got to do both. And so we pray as if, as if everything depends on God, but we work as if everything depends on us. You know, there's that phrase that's been thrown around for a while, just let go and let God, right? And that rubs me the wrong way a little bit. I got to be honest. That rubs me the wrong way. I know it's fun to say. I know it's encouraging. And that's good if you're like a control freak and you want to micromanage what God's trying to do in your life. Let go and let God. But let go and let God doesn't apply to the practical living. Like, let go and let God with my finances. No, like, live by a budget, okay? Right? Like, let go and let God with my car maintenance. No, just go get the oil change and put the new tires on. Right? There is a very real and practical side of this life that we have to live to be good stewards of the resources that God placed in our lives and to live a life according to his word. Spiritual and practical. Right? Let's do it. Let's be balanced. Verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. Just some very clear, authentic feelings right now that they're experiencing, all right? And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the walls. You see, there was progress, and then there was discouragement. They're tired. They're weary. They've been doing this for a while. This isn't their, their skill. This isn't their craft. This isn't their trade. They're not used to this kind of labor. And so they're tired. And then verse 11, also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. How about opposition, right? Like your life's going to be gone. We're going to destroy your work on top of it. You know, insult to injury right there. And then verse 12, look at this. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us right? Like this is their own people. These are the Jews within the area of uh, Judea that are coming to them and saying like, hey, bad things are going to happen. Get ready. Like, I thought you're on our side. This is your city too. What are you talking about? And so there's all kinds of opposition that comes our way. It's from outsiders. It's from our own people we're in close relationship with, spiritual difficulties. Um, and oftentimes, you know, all those outside voices, they are tough to deal with. But what I've found to be true is that the voice that I have, I have the most difficult time dealing with is the internal voice. That voice up here, right? Man, that's going to be tough. You can't do that. No, oh, that's going to be so much work. So much internal opposition, right? That inner voice. Who do you think you are? You're just one person. You're never going to make a difference. What do you think you can do that's going to be any different than what anyone else tried before? You don't have what it takes, right? That's one of those common phrases that can really shut us down internally. And here's what I've learned. The external opposition will only be as loud as my internal insecurities allow them to be. So the more you allow that internal voice and internal insecurity to have a bigger platform and a bigger voice, that's how much room and how big of an opening you give those exterior voices. Because if you give them a platform, it's going to get louder. It's going to amplify whatever's being said out there. The moment Nehemiah started to battle his own insecurities, we see that something different took place. 
You see, he battled what was internal with him, and then there was a shift. The focus went from himself back onto God and the mission. Verse 14, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. You see, this is really important here. In all endeavors of life that we proceed into, never remove the Lord from that equation. Never count him out. Never write him off. Never forget where he stands in the process of what he's called you to do. We always remember the Lord in the process and how great he is. So what it does is it takes the focus off of ourself and it puts the focus back onto who needs the focus, the Lord, our God. This isn't our battle, it's the Lord's. You see, he, he is with us and he fights our battles for us and he goes before us and he makes a way where it seems like there is no way. You see, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if God is for you, who can be against you? No one. He is for you. And so the external opposition will only be as loud as my internal insecurities allow them to be. I want to encourage you this morning to remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord. Remember who he is. And so Nehemiah is telling his fellow Jews, remember who our heavenly father is. Remember the greatness of the Lord. Remember how he rescued our ancestors out of the Egyptian bondage. Remember how he split the Red Sea and how they crossed through on dry ground. Remember when he led them with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Remember how he provided for their needs, how he gave them water by striking the rock and water literally poured out of a rock. Remember how he provided manna from heaven and and quail from heaven to feed each and every one of them. Remember the work of the Lord and how faithful he is. Remember the history of God coming through. Remember how God has been faithful in your salvation. Remember how God has provided for you. Remember how the blessings of the Lord pour out in your life. Remember about the healings and the miracles that he's accomplished in your life and in your loved ones. Remember the goodness of the Lord. And so the greater the opposition, the greater the opportunity for our God to fight for you. Are you facing something insurmountable this morning? Are you facing something bigger than yourself? I want to encourage you today because it might seem big and it might seem daunting and it might seem impossible to you, but it's a huge platform for the Lord to be exposed on and to show up and to show his might and his power and his goodness in your life. And so that opposition you face, that hardship that you're in right now, is an opportunity for our God to fight for you. Now that's a moment where you let go and let God. Okay, when your resources are exhausted or when you've tried to micromanage that thing to death, I want to encourage you to say, give it to God. Give it to God because he fights for us. He's on our side. He is our advocate through everything that we face. And so he is working in us and through us. Back to verse 14 here. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. What's Nehemiah doing here? The fight's not about us versus them. It's not Jews versus Samaritans. It's not Jews versus Ammonites. You're fighting for something. You're not fighting someone. You're fighting for something. You fight for what's yours, for what the Lord has given you, for your wife. You fight for your sons. You fight for your daughters. You fight for your homes, the things that mean the most to you. You fight for that. That's the practical that we take action in today. We stand up and we fight. We become diligent and obedient to following through with what God has placed before us. And so we we muster up the strength that we need to stand, to pick up one more block and put it back on the wall, to rebuild one more gate and set it and make sure it's plumb and it locks and latches to secure a city and to keep a people safe. You keep going back to that rock pile. You clear out the rubble. You move it away. I don't care how hard it is. You got to get up and you got to fight. Because Nehemiah is saying, look, I see how bad things are. But my God is far greater than anything you'll ever experience. So choose to pick up that rock and put it back in place because how you fight matters. Be diligent. Be obedient. Be thorough in how you fight. Don't give up. Don't give in. Fight for your home. Fight for your land. Fight for your God. Stand today and fight for Him. And so now, know that whenever you do something that matters for God, you're going to face opposition. 
Are you struggling with what you're getting pushed back against? Like what you're experiencing pushback with in your life? Maybe there's a greater purpose than just it being a good idea. Maybe there's something so God-sized in it that you don't even realize the full potential of what it pertains to for what's contained within that little vision, that little dream. You see, we gotta stand. We gotta fight. We gotta press on and press forward and trust that God is with us. And so if I've understood that if I'm not ready for opposition, for my obedience to God, I'm not ready to be used by God. If I'm not ready for that opposition that's gonna come from saying yes to God, I'm not ready to serve God. We're gonna face hardship. We're gonna face trials. We're gonna face temptation and opposition. But we have the words of Nehemiah to help us navigate through that. To say yes to the Lord. To say, I will fight. I will stand. I will battle for what matters the most in my life. And so when you face a battle in opposition, we see that Nehemiah sat down and he cried. We saw that he knelt down and prayed. And then he stood up to act. Then he put together a plan. And in that process, in his plan, he sought God faithfully. And he defined the vision clearly. And he made plans carefully. And he inspired people passionately. He inspired people to make a difference and to fight for their land. Now remember the Lord your God and who you fight for and what God has called you to fight for. We got to fight. We got to take a stand. We got to understand that God is with us and that we might face opposition, but our God is greater than any opposition that we will ever come against and that will ever come against us. He is greater. Just real quick in this moment, I can't help but think that there might be someone here that you've experienced some opposition in your life. That you might be here in church for the first time ever in your life and you've had the understanding that if I walk in the doors of a church that that building's gonna crumble. It's gonna look like Jerusalem, right? The ceiling's gonna come in. Church isn't a place for me. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. You see, this is a place that is welcoming and inviting for all people. So that opposition that you've experienced has probably been something that's been pushing you back and and limiting you from saying yes to Jesus. And today, I want to give you the opportunity to fight that opposition, a battle of your soul that you're going to want to win. And here's the good news. The hard work has already been done for you by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, when he went to the cross, he laid down his life. And he said, the sin of all humanity is upon my back. The stripes that I took on my back from all the lashings are for you. The wound in my side where my blood poured out was for you. The holes in my hands and my feet was for you. The way that I laid down my life on that cross was for you and for your sin. It was for me as well. Because I, just like you, need the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And by that, we are able to stand before our Heavenly Father in perfect sight, clean, whole, made right and well in His eyes. That price has already been paid. So the only opposition that's left is the battle maybe in your mind or your heart. And the ability just to say, yes, I want to make that commitment to Jesus Christ to allow Him to be my Lord and Savior. So here this morning, I'm going to ask that we bow our heads, we close our eyes. And if that's you today, If you're wanting to say, you know what? I'm done messing around. I'm done fighting fights that don't matter. I'm done living a life that has been of my own agenda and it's only caused me pain, hurt, discomfort, discord. It's ruined relationships in my life. If you're ready to say yes to Jesus, would you just slide your hand up real quick? No one else looking around. I wanna pray with you today and we're gonna pray together. You see, the power of our Lord is great and we believe that he has the ability to set you free from anything that you've experienced. Thank you for that hand. You may slide it back down. If there's anyone else today, we're going to pray this prayer together. And I encourage you to pray this prayer with us. And all you have to do is just mean it from your heart. And you've made an eternal difference and change of direction for your life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, today I surrender my will. And I receive your gift of salvation. I believe that I am made holy I am made pure and I am made right in your eyes through the action of your son, Jesus Christ. So any opposition 
that may come against me, I know it means nothing because you are greater than anything I experience. So Lord, help me to live according to your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Lord, we love you. That is awesome. That is the best single most decision you could ever make in your life because you just changed the location of your eternal destination. You committed your life to Jesus and now we're going to take steps of walking forward and what that means. And so that's going through uh, the steps of, of learning how to pray and reading your Bible on a regular basis and taking steps, being regular in church and connecting with other believers and being in close proximity to people who know how to walk with Christ. And so I want to encourage you to take those steps. Today, if you're here and you have a need for prayer, uh, we have a prayer team that's right out in the lobby that would love to pray with you. You heard about our gifts and our offerings and tithes. They're, they're in the box there. If you're here today and you made that commitment to follow Jesus Christ, there are these cards in the, in the chair back in front of you in the pocket. I would ask that you would just fill out the blue one. It just simply says, I have decided. And all that's saying is, I made a commitment to follow Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You can drop the card off in our, one of our offering boxes, and it just lets us celebrate with you the great choice that you made today. There's some other cards there as well. If you want to serve or need prayer or want to connect, uh, update some information there, you can utilize those in the chair back in front of you. And make sure you pick up that faith promise as well, okay? We love you so much. Don't be afraid of the opposition. Look to God in those moments, all right? Do the spiritual, do the practical. I love you. We will see you next week. Go and make a difference. <laughs> love you. Bye.